Okay, hello and welcome to another panel discussion and this week's topic, this month's topic is the do's and the don'ts of pipeline management. Uh, my name is John Golden from SalesPop Online Sales Magazine, that's salespop.net, and Pipeliner CRM, the world's most visual CRM. And today I've been joined by a fantastic panel of pipeline management experts who are going to discuss this topic um, with all of you. Now, if you have a question during the uh, during the panel discussion, please just pop it into the questions box, and I will. Uh, I will either answer it directly or I'll put it to the panel. Uh, so just put it in the questions box. And of course, you will also get a recording of this uh, of this panel discussion uh, and uh, you can share that with your friends. So rather than me uh, introduce each of the, the panelists and read through their bios, I thought I'd give them a chance to introduce themselves. It's more interesting. So um, Jason, why don't you give a short intro to who you are? Sure. Well, as it says on your screen, I'm a partner at Vantage Point. We primarily focus on uh, training sales managers. And in service of that, we do a lot of research into sales management issues. So pipeline management, forecasting, coaching, um, some of the things we're going to talk about today. So I'm happy for the opportunity to be here. Great. Thanks, Jason. And Judy. Hi. So I'm Judy Frank. And as you can see on the screen, I'm with uh, the Rain Group, just one of the top 20 sales training and advisory companies in the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we do a lot of research to understand how buyers are buying and why they buy and how they want to be sold to. And so as a result, we provide training for salespeople as well as sales managers to help them acquire new accounts and sell more to existing accounts. Perfect. And Bruce. Yeah, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hello, Jason. Hello, Judy. Hello, John. Uh, Bruce Waterburn, um, Head of Sales for Integrity Solutions, and we're a 50-year organization celebrating our 50th year uh, in business this year. Um, and I've been, as it says there on the screen, over 20 years in sales performance improvement. Um, and we help organizations win more customers, keep more customers, and grow their profitable revenues. So, the subject of pipeline management is a way of keeping score of that, and so really interested in today's discussion. Excellent. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, so what I thought I would do is I thought I would start off and maybe start off with a baseline definition of pipeline management, because one thing that I found over the years is that sometimes pipeline management it can mean different things to different people, or sometimes people aren't exactly sure what is meant by pipeline management. I think everybody gets the overall concept, but uh, um, Jason, what, what would you, how would you define pipeline management? Well, this is a, a great question. We have a whole conversation just on this topic I think of what is it and so we you know we think of it in a couple ways when we have a program a training program that's very specifically focused on pipeline management and actually putting a box around what it is is a critical thing to do so we would say that to engage in pipeline management effectively you need to uh, be in a situation where you're selling you know, multi-stage opportunities uh, a lot of people try to shove accounts and other things territories into the pipeline it never really works and so for it to be effective we need to really be talking about it a collection of opportunities that have a beginning and an end and steps along the way. And the second thing I'd say is uh, it, there's a challenge to sing, distinguishing it from forecasting because most people do use the pipeline to uh, create a forecast. And we would say that you know, pipeline management is really the activity of building a healthy pipeline. And there are some metrics to talk about for that and winning more of the deals that are in it. And um, you know, just distinguished from forecasting because you're not picking a date and a, and a probability of close and a size of the deal. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge in most people's heads is separating pipeline management, which is about the management of opportunities from from forecasting. So, uh, as I said, it's a great question. I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the next two answers. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great uh, great answer, Jason. Because yeah, I would totally agree. I think. Uh, um, people use uh, pipeline management and forecasting almost like you know they're synonymous or they swap and uh, they use either term sometimes. Okay, um, and Judy, what would your definition of pipeline management be? You know, it, it, as uh, as Jason said, it's it's really um, an interesting concept and it's one that most organizations struggle with. Um, to me, it's really having a clear process that defines the various stages for each step of the opportunity and having that clearly defined in terms of what those stages are and what percentages are applied to them in terms of probability of closure. Um, 
and having that pipeline process embedded in your CRM helps to manage it most effectively. Listen, so it's uh, so it's all about process, right? It's yes. All about defined processes. Suspects, uh, suspects, qualified opportunity, closable, and being sense. able to track where the opportunity is at each of those stages and what needs to be done to uh, facilitate and accelerate that opportunity to move through the various stages. Nathan, and you, Bruce, what's your definition? Well, John, rather than uh, repeat what has already been said, mm -hmm. let me add on to it. There's something I said earlier, I think, really resonates that pipeline is, is a way of keeping score. Now, let me say what I mean by that is that if we as an organization have decided that we're going to change our strategy this year, we're going to realign our territories, we're going to hire some new salespeople, we're going to train our managers, we're going to do these things. Okay, well, how do we know if that's been successful in moving the needle in terms of results uh, before we get to those results? Um, the late stage forecast is certainly one thing, but how do we know we're going to improve our late stage forecast? Well, let's look at what are we doing in the early stages? What's happening in terms of pipeline growth? Uh, I'll talk a little bit later on about the, 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 the three key metrics that, to look at. But it's a way of saying, okay, is, did the strategic direction we're taking this company, is it paying off or is it likely to pay off for us? Or we've maybe decided not change. We're going to do what we've always done. And if that's the case, uh, that's a strategic decision. How's that working out? Let's see if we can keep score of that over the next you know, few months in terms of looking at the pipeline, see if we're moving the needle in some of the key areas. Yeah, excellent. I like that idea about, about keeping score and uh, and reviewing. I think sometimes, you know, we tend to look backwards too much and not enough at what's happening right in front of us right now. Um, uh, moving on to the next uh, one, uh, Judy, what are some of the key mistakes you see sales managers make with their approach to pipeline management? You know, this is uh, it's a great question, and this is something that just uh, continues to astound me. Um, I've led sales organizations for three Fortune 50 corporations for 30 years. And during that time, I've encountered uh, many different organizations that operate uh, differently. And what I see with sales managers is that they tend to think of pipeline meetings where they just focus on the numbers. What are the statistics? How many calls have you made? How many meetings have you had? Um, and not really looking at what's happening about the opportunity. Uh, not talking about the people that they're positioned with, or the relationship strength, or the customer's goals, or what the bu customer's buying process is, or what's in it for the customer, or competitive positioning. So my experience has been the sales managers tend to focus on the numbers and keeping score, as, uh, as Bruce indicated, um, but not really peeling the onion back to understand what is the status of those opportunities, what are the what's, what is it that we know, and what's the white space? What's the stuff that we don't know that we need to know in order to move the opportunity forward? Great, thank you. And and Jason, what have you seen some of the the key mistakes that uh, managers make? Oh, so many. Um, well, I mean, I, I just pick a few when planning for this conversation. I'll mm -hmm. try and move through them quickly. I mean, the first one I've already mentioned is confusing pipeline management with forecasting. You know, forecasting is a necessity. You have to do it. Senior leadership uses it to manage resources and run the business and communicate to Wall Street. But no one's ever won a deal because of forecasting, you know, assigning a close date to and a size to a, to a deal. And really need to understand that it's a coaching tool. It's not a forecasting tool. I think it's actually the greatest coaching tool that most people have inside the organization. So the, the first one I kind of touched on before, you know, the, the next one I'd say is that um, speaking of a bigger pipeline is a better pipeline. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of um, management decisions that are made and a lot of direction given to the sales force that are driven toward filling the pipeline with stuff. And what we've seen in our research is that smaller pipelines can be much more productive because you're not encouraging the salespeople to pile in, in the junk that just is fodder, you know, that keep pushing out the, the closed dates. And people, unfortunately, also spend energy on deals that are never going to be won. And mm -hmm. that kind of comes down to qualification and, disqual and, and disqualification you know, criteria for deals that 
that go in there. And then the, you know, the, the third behavior that I'd, I'd pick out is that we see sales managers really focusing on late stage opportunities. So deals that are, you know, forecasted the next 30 days, deals that are just about to close. And there are a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, there's so much energy around those deals because they are in the forecast and it, they're visible if they're big deals. And also just because it's fun. You know, all, mm-hmm. all, all sales managers were successful salespeople at one time. And if they're honest, you know, they probably enjoyed selling more than, more than they enjoy their, their current role. And, and so the, this gravitation toward the end of the deal is a little sad because, you know, in most situations, especially if it's a very long sales cycle, the, the decision's probably been made. You know, and we do the same thing when a deal is almost ready to close. We wring our hands and, oh, have we done everything we need to do? Have we talked to every moment? But they, they've made their decision probably halfway through the sales process. They just haven't told us. And, you know, so we, we've, our research shows that when sales managers engage early in the sales process, when it seems like there's maybe even not enough there to really have a coaching conversation about, you know, they, they do a better job of qualifying the good deals and disqualifying the bad deals. And they do a better job of coaching the salespeople to set the stage through better strategy, better approach uh, uh, to, to win the deal. So I'd, I'd say that, uh, you know, of all of them, it's the forecasting um, and, 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 and versus pipeline management thing. It's the, the bigger is better syndrome. And then it's just this desire to engage late in the deal when research shows that engaging early in the deal can be even more productive. Yeah, those are great points, uh, Jason. And in fact, uh, as we move on to Bruce, uh, Bruce and I, a number of years ago when we were colleagues, we coined the phrase the feel good funnel for exactly that is where you <laughs> is where people pile a load of a load of opportunities into the early stages to make them feel good about their pipeline. Right. Even yeah. though the majority of them then fall out later. So, um, uh, Bruce, what are some of the key mistakes you see sales managers make when it comes to pipeline management? Well, you just touched on one there, John. I remember the feel-good funnel. Then the the opposite of that was the realistic funnel. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, I remember applying that concept to a, um, a web services company. And uh, I remember going through and the, with the VP of sales and let's let's take a look at what is the feel-good funnel. Let's take a look at what is a more realistic funnel if we apply some, some qualifiers to it. And I remember uh, it was about 50% of the value of that funnel dropped out. And um, when you applied a dose of reality to it, uh, which was great for him, but then he had to go and explain to the CEO why 50% of the pipeline dropped out. So that was, it was a bit of an awkward conversation. Fortunately, the CEO uh, understood that one. But I think in addition to what's been told, a common factor is managers who get wedded to the, the CRM and they get wedded to an analytical discussion of, of numbers and opportunities without realizing that, especially in the early stages, it's about the execution in front of the customer. That's what's going to drive, make or break your pipeline. So so things like, does the customer clearly understand the contrast between their current situation and their desired situation? Does the, does the customer clearly understand the cost of inaction or the being staying, staying with status quo? Uh, is the sales rep getting a commitment from the customer to move the opportunity forward? And what is it? And is that specific or is it vague? Uh, and do do they clearly understand who's what's the decision-making team and what decisions are going to be made at what stage? They're some of the key questions that managers need to be asking in the early stages of the pipeline, not necessarily about when it's going to close and how much it's going to be worth. But a lot of that comes down to do the salespeople have the skills and the abilities to execute and get answers to those questions when the manager's not there? Uh, and that's frequently overlooked in term, in this whole subject of pipeline management. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Bruce, is like, are, they, are the opportunities coming in properly qualified? And as you say, have the salespeople executed um, sufficiently in order to qualify them? And I like what you said about when the sales manager's not around. Um, but just touching back for a moment, um, uh, Jason, just on the same subject, um, you know, both Bruce just gave that example about the web services company. When you work with organizations as well, is how difficult is it to get them to reduce their pipeline to be realistic as opposed to having a bloated one that maybe makes them feel better? Well, it, it's not that hard. I mean, most people want to do the right things. and 
once it's pointed out that they're doing something that's counterproductive, people will pretty quickly adopt it. And, you know, as Judy said, a lot of this comes down to putting process in place. And so, for instance, we work with a um, part of our program or pipeline coaching program, which I mentioned earlier, is is how to identify the right size of a pipeline. And, and you know, the teaching is that there's a right size for every salesperson and it's not always 3x. Mm -hmm. You know, so that three X comes from some organizational analysis that said we went a third of our pipeline. So we need three times our pipeline in there. But in reality, a new sales rep may only win 15 percent of the pipeline and an experienced sales rep who's got a good territory. And the whole thing may may win 50 percent of their stuff and a two X pipeline might be fine for them. And, and so there are kind of insights like that, that once people are exposed to them, they go. Yeah, you know, you're right. A, a new salesperson does need a bigger pipeline than an experienced one. Or, or when we point out, point out the early stage intervention versus the late stage, you know, people go, yeah, you're right. I should do that more. <laughs> so it's, it's um, I don't think it's as much. I think, as I said, people want to do the right things. People just aren't taught to do the right things. And there's just, you know, the, the, there are assumptions that people live with, like bigger is better. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, it, they're they're counterproductive. So, our, you know, I often think we're more of an executive education group than a training group because you know, we're really just exposing people to frameworks and decision making um, approaches that that lead to better management. And you know, what, what we do is a lot less about muscle memory. And and so it's not it's not as hard as you would think once you know what you want to happen. Makes sense. All right, uh, Judy, maybe you kick off this one. Um, so uh, do you think salespeople take enough responsibility for managing their own pipelines? Because we've been talking a lot about sales managers, and rightly so. Uh, but what about uh, salespeople managing their own pipelines? Because I think sometimes we don't, um, or salespeople don't take enough accountability. You know, in today's world, it's very interesting. Um, when I work with sales organizations, they typically look to marketing because marketing has been doing the heavy lifting and they're the ones who are running the campaigns. And then uh, the inside sales team oftentimes is uh, fielding the inbound leads and qualifying them and then passing them to the outbound team. Um, and, the, and now what many organizations are recognizing is that's just not enough. Mm -hmm. Their outside salespeople need to be continuing to fill the funnel and identify new opportunities and augment whatever inbound leads are coming in, as well as what referrals, um, um, other partners or uh, past customers. So it's, it's an area that a lot of companies are actually struggling with and we did a study recently on <clears throat> excuse me prospecting mm -hmm. um, we asked over 400 customers and over 400 salespeople uh, that were, were responsible for 4.2 billion dollars in purchasing across 25 industries about prospecting and we asked buyers what is it that they how they how do they want to be prospected to and they said that they want to hear from uh, sellers early. And what they want is new ideas, new perspectives, new ways of solving their problems, insights into their industry, insights into challenges that maybe they haven't even encountered yet. And they want to um, be contacted initially via email, but they absolutely want to be called. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that a lot of salespeople are relying mostly on social media and emails. And what we're hearing from buyers is they want you to pick up the phone. They want you to reach out and they want to hear from you around how they can benefit from working with you and your organization and what kind of value can you bring to the table. Excellent. So I think it's important that the salesperson takes responsibility for creating that target list and having a, um, a cadence and a, uh, a campaign, a multi-touch, multimodal campaign where they're reaching out to prospects um, with, a, with valuable ideas and, and best practices as well as um, a cadence to how they're going to be reaching out to them and have that organized in a way that uh, 
focuses on what we call the greatest impact activities, where they're going to get the greatest return on their investment of time and yeah. action. No, I think um, very good points there because I do think that um, you know people have gotten a little, um, shall we say, spoiled over the last number of years with all the focus and inbound on and relying on other people to fill their pipelines for them. So I think that's a great piece of advice there. Uh, I do think salespeople need to be doing more and not relying on you know one or two um, ways of filling a pipeline. Uh, Bruce, do you think salespeople take enough responsibility for managing their own pipelines? Well, John, the answer to that would be yes and no, and it comes down often to the individual. And I, I think there's there's one question that the majority of the listeners to this uh, webinar are, are probably asking, and they may be thinking, "Yeah, this, this this is good. All this is good, but isn't it a little academic? Because I could compare my, you know, go through the pipeline, compare my dollar size to average deal one size, or opportunity age versus my win cycle or my win rate of deals in certain stage over over 30 days versus the, all of these things about how we can slice and dice the data. But isn't the real the question is, how do I get my salespeople to actually enter information? We did a uh, some work recently with an HR consulting firm where the top three salespersons, including the number one, who sold twice as much as the number two. Uh, but the top three just to, I'm not going to, I'm not doing any CRM stuff. Uh, I'm just not going to do it. Um, and if you, if you, uh, if you don't I, I'll fire me, I'll, I'll go to a competitor, but I'm not doing it. So that's an extreme example, but I think that that exists in every one of the organizations that's listening to this. And the number one challenge, I mean, the guys at Salesforce will tell you the number one challenge they face is not necessarily uh, the the what slicing and dicing the data is getting accurate data in in the first place from salespeople. So I think your question there, John, is a really good one, and it is it is, it is really the toughest question of the day. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's actually one of the things that when we did with Pipeline at CRM is we give uh, salespeople the exact same tools as a manager, so they can actually get the benefit of being able to manage their own pipelines, uh, but. Uh, Jason, what do you see? Uh, do you see salespeople taking enough responsibility for managing their own pipelines? Because sometimes I feel that you need to get bogged down in opportunities and that, and yeah, maybe a little bit of forecasting ahead, but real active management, like you said, like me going back and really uh, cleaning up their pipelines and stuff. Sometimes I don't think there's enough pro proactiveness there. Well, I, I agree. But I mean, to the question of whether there's enough responsibility, I think so. And I, and I say that because of the visibility the sales pipeline has in most organizations. You know, in our some of the research we did on pipeline management best practices, we asked people how often they were meeting to discuss the pipeline. We asked them how much time they were spending in those meetings. And more than half the companies, and I think everyone will agree with this, you know, there was an expectation that the managers were going to meet with the sales reps more than once a month. To talk about a lot of a lot of them weekly, mm -hmm. and the average meeting was 50, 53 minutes. So, I mean, if you think about the amount of time that sales managers and salespeople spend staring at pipeline reports and looking at CRM and the visibility that the pipeline and the forecast have, I, I think they're responsible. Um, I, I don't think they've been taught what to do. Mm -hmm. And as you know, as I said before, there there's a lot of attention on it, but you know the attention is feeding the pipeline, you know, growing it, making it big enough. And, you know, the, the pressures on the sales managers to help people win deals, which means they gravitate toward the deals that are just about to close where maybe or maybe they don't have impact. So I think there's responsibility. I think they're, they're, they're held accountable to it because of its visibility and the way it's measured and reported. You know, I, I think where they fall down is they literally just don't know what to do. And they're operating with some gut assumptions that make sense. Like, why wouldn't bigger be better? Mm -hmm. And if, it, if my role is to help salespeople win deals, why wouldn't I be there when the deal is won or lost? You know, it's, it's intuitive, but, but, but counterproductive in, in many cases, not in every cases. But we, we see a lot of deviant behavior that's driven by people trying to do the obvious thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's a lot of things that um, are, are 
you know seem intuitive but um but they're not the right behavior as you say and i do and i do totally agree with you i think sometimes it's because people aren't taught what the right behaviors are so there's not enough investment in that piece um just a quick comment from one of our uh, our viewers today listeners um vicky she just wanted to say thank you judy for the reminder to pick up the phone <laughs> she said human contact is my best action yeah i couldn't agree with you more it's amazing how that phone thing has become so, you know, anathema to some people. Okay, so um, let's let's get down in, let's let's get down into some practical uh, pieces here, and maybe Bruce kick off this. What what are some best practices that you would recommend when it comes to pipeline management? I think a really key one, John, is that it's very easy for managers, and this is a a big challenge we see with the emerging role of sales enablement, but it's a it, 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 we can be seduced into overcomplicating what we're trying to measure, and and that's one of the things that drives a low adoption of uh, of many CRMs and pipeline reports from salespeople. Uh, it's they say it, it's just too complex. I don't really understand it. It really comes down from a management perspective of, of a few simple questions. To reach our goals this year, do we have enough deals in the pipeline? Are the deals of a fit, sufficient state, a sufficient size? And are they progressing at the pace we need them to progress uh, through the pipeline and into the forecast? And where are we seeing the gaps? Where are we seeing the the deals breaking down. Uh, is there any consistency either by rep or by division or across the organization? And I think that the one of the best practices when it comes to training people around this is it, it can be seducing to think, well, we just need to be really zero focused on plugging the holes. What I mean by that, mm -hmm. we've got we've got people who we see, you know, let me pick out some names. We've got Sally over here. And she tends to lose deals more at stage three, so therefore she needs an online module around how to present better. And we've got Dave, he tends to lose deals very early on and they don't progress, so he needs something on just how to ask some more in-depth questions and develop the need. Uh, but it's like plugging the dike in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a dam. You, you put your finger in one and another comes out. So. People need much more – salespeople need to be able to execute well across all stages and trying to, to be, you know, quote, targeted in training interventions to help them is generally we're seeing uh, a, a huge time waster for management leadership team. So I think there's a couple of best practices there uh, in terms of simplicity and in terms of more holistic skill development to help salespeople execute face-to-face -face with the customer, which is – really the biggest driver of pipeline growth. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't re agree more. Um, one of the things that we see a lot of, obviously, you know, you know, we're a CRM company, but what we see a lot of is that there's so many sales tools and point solutions coming out that people can fall into the shiny new t tool syndrome. And before you know it, uh, they're trying to find a tool to solve every little, you know, problem as opposed to, you know, just you perhaps using the tools that they have to more effect and be more strategic in their approach. Uh, um, how about you, Judy? What are some best practices that you would recommend when it comes to pipeline management? Yeah, I really liked uh, a couple of points that uh, we just heard. Um, so I want to kind of uh, expand on, on those a bit because you know, I don't want to stay focused just on the numbers in terms of um, you know, how many deals are in the pipeline and what are the volume indicators, and, <clears throat> excuse me, what are the dashboards showing. But I think what's really important is to have account plans. Um, our research has shown that having account plans that show where your position within the organization, what the opportunities are, what are the strategies that you're going to employ, who are you going to need to be positioned with in order to move the opportunities forward, what types of resources are you going to require from the organization in order to uh, enable you to be successful. Um, people who have account plans are typically able to generate in excess of 30 to 40 percent more opportunities within an account and move them to closer in a short period of time. The other best practice is um, 
training the team on how to prospect. I mean, actually how to write emails so that you're answering questions that the customers want to hear, you know, and that you need to know why now, why do, should they take action now? Um, why act? What is it that about the situation, the problem that they're having um, that's compelling them to move forward to actually explore a solution? And then why should they choose you? Why should they choose you? What differentiates you from the competition? What is it that you're going to bring to the table based on your research and understanding of the company, the industry that they're in, as well as the excellent discovery process that you've gone through? How are you going to be helping them and why should they trust you that you're gonna be able to deliver on the promise? So why now, why act, why, why trust and why us? And then the third best practice to me is all around productivity. Mm -hmm. It's really about helping people to focus on doing the right activities that will produce the greatest return on their, on their investment. And we actually um, also have done a study recently and, and found that it's about motivation. And motivation comes in two forms. Of course, it's, there's the intrinsic motivation, you know, the fire in the belly and extrinsic. So we're talking about the intrinsic. How can you create higher levels of motivation for people where they are wanting to you know, get their get up and go going? Um, and we found that things like task clarity is really important. Uh, I think it was mentioned that you know, they don't know what to do. So being very clear about what are the things that they need to do in order to move the opportunity forward are, is critical. And something as subtle as uh, having a winner's mindset where you actually you know, are doing self-talk and creating um, confidence in terms of what it, you know, how you're coming across as well as what your intentions are for the day or for that call or for that meeting. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's all about um, controlling time. Right. Time is the one thing that we can't get more of. So it's really being obsessive around how to control our time. And so it's about scheduling time on your calendar for thinking, scheduling time on your calendar for prospecting, scheduling time on your calendar to do research. It's about really controlling your schedule and mm -hmm. controlling your calendar that will help people to be more proactive in terms of how they are operating, as well as ignoring distractions. Mm -hmm. um, we did um, a study and we found that uh, salespeople are basically distracted uh, up to two hours a day. Social media, they you know, start to you know, surf the web, mm -hmm. they have other conversations, people mm -hmm. are multitasking, it's creating a lot of distractions. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's impacting people's ability to focus. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think I, I think we all, to be honest, we all fall into this trap nowadays of, you know, we say, oh, we're, we're all so busy. We're busier than we ever were. But the reality is that if you really analyzed um, everybody's day, you would find that there's probably a lot of distractions that come in that are unnecessary. Um, and I also like that point. Yes, you can't create more time, but you can certainly control your mindset and, um, you know, having that winning mentality. Um, Jason, what are some what are some best practices that you would uh, you would recommend? So our perspective on um, this is always from leadership's perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we train and develop leadership teams in big mm -hmm. companies for sales, sales leadership teams. And so you know, we've done quite a bit of research on management practices and what drives productivity. And the, the top three that came up in our list, um, the first is, and this is surprising, but I think everyone on the phone will, will agree, you know, the most, <laughs> it, it's actually not intuitive, the most powerful thing management could do in our research was to define a formal sales process. Mm -hmm. And it was meaningfully impactful on how productive their sales pipelines were. And I think it, it, makes, it makes sense once you think about it. You know, if you don't have a well-designed sales process, you can't do any of the stuff that Bruce mentioned, right? Any of the analytics or, well, actually you can do the analytics, but they spit out gibberish mm -hmm. and, you know, it makes it impossible to coach people because if you don't have confidence that the stages are defined properly and, you know, if salespeople are putting them in the wrong stages, you can't coach, right? You can't get the insights that you need to do all the things that 
that make a sales pipeline more productive. So the first thing is just making sure that you have a well-defined sales process. And I think if you look at what's in a lot of CRM tools, you'd find it's, it's just junk. Yeah. And then the the second one, which is um, also in, insightful, is that the sales managers, remember, I recall I asked how frequently they were having these discussions and how much time they were spending. Now, there's kind of a break point in productivity when sales managers spent three hours per month per rep. So they spent three hours per month in sales pipeline meetings. And I don't think the the insight there is that you need to spend a lot of time on the pipeline. I think the insight is that if you're spending more time, it's probably because you're coaching. Mm-hmm. And if you're reviewing the pipeline for 45 minutes a month, it's probably just to scrub the data, make sure the forecast is up to date. But if you're spending meaningful a meaningful amount of time with salespeople, you're probably starting to have conversations about the deals. Oh, tell me about this deal. Who are the buyers? You know, why can we win? Why would we lose? And then the and then the third thing, um, which is fully self promoting, but it's what the research said is that they, mm-hmm. they felt like the sales managers have been adequately cha- trained in pipeline management strategies and tactics, and I think that's self explanatory. And we've we kind of talked about that. So, um, yeah, there are several things that leadership can do to make their pipelines more productive, and and they typically come. They I mean, even when we looked at forecasting best practices, when we look at coaching best practices, the themes always are define what you expect to happen and hold people accountable to doing it. And, um, and I think that's surely, surely the case with pipeline management. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think you touched on some excellent points there. I think the, the first one around uh, around sales process, uh, and it's something that you know, we come across a lot of the time. It seems sometimes people don't have a sales process. Sometimes they have a sales process, but it hasn't been touched in like two or three years. And sales processes should be dynamic because buyer behavior changes, circumstance change. You you should be learning from analyzing and learning from your sales process and adjusting it as as necessary. So I could agree more. I think sales process is absolutely uh, it's absolutely critical, and I think it you know helps everybody at the end of the day because it gives people a a path and a track to run on and a way of you know analyzing things for themselves. All right, let's move on here. And um, in this question, I would want to have some examples of companies you've worked with and how they changed their pipeline approach uh, for the better. I don't need names, obviously, but just just some real world examples that you can give where where you've seen this work. Um, and Bruce, how about uh, you kick off this one? Yeah, sure, John. I think there was um, one organization. It was a medical products slash technology organization. Um, that was had a management team that was very gung ho about pipeline management forecasting and, and bringing science to what was um, a, a more of a, 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 a lackadaisical attitude towards this when they brought in two or three uh, new uh, managers and a director of operations, and um, they said we're going to we're going to as managers we're going to really apply the, the science to our pipeline and. and they ended up overcomplicating things by uh, by putting too many um, different rules and regulations in there. And it was going back to something that Judy mentioned earlier in terms of pipeline uh, establishing a process there um, and also establishing a level of motivation amongst the team to take greater ownership of this. And, and it really was about redefining this thing called coaching. So I'll just touch on both of those. The sales process that they had in place, they had a, a good six-step process. So they had multiple st- uh, stages and they had different milestones within each one of these stages. The trouble is when you looked at that, each one of the stages was about what the seller needed to be doing. Mm-hmm. So it was about you know, we had our first meeting, we uh, had our second meeting, we presented proposal, we negotiated terms, we resolved objections. It was all about us focused. Us, 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 meaning the seller. Uh, so one of the things we did was help them think through that and, and incorporate into that, well, what do you want the buyer to be doing at each stage? What what actions do you want them to take that's going to move it forward? And so the buyer and the seller are walking in lockstep as you go through the sales process. Uh, that was number one. Number two is redefining this thing called coaching. And they they were falling into the trap of thinking coaching was all about let's look at opportunities and let's look at deals and let's look at your pipeline and let's look at your numbers. And rather than really talking to the person about what's the fire in your belly? What really motivates you? What can I be doing as a manager to help you realize your most important goals? 
Uh, and we find if you start to tap into that and develop more of this thing called achievement drive, Judy touched on it when she mentioned motivation, and a lot of the other things that sales managers get need to continually manage their salespeople, they start to take care of themselves. Salespeople start to enter information a little bit more. They start to do those things. They start to think about training. They start to open up and, and take a good look at their own skills and abilities. So I think there's two that for that one organization, those two things, one about putting buyer commitments in the sales process, but also rethinking this thing called coaching, that it's not about pipeline management. It's not about looking at numbers or deals. It's really about looking at the person, building and developing them. Those were two things that made a huge difference. Yeah, and uh, those are great ones, uh, Bruce. And I do remember actually us going through that process ourselves back in the day when we realized that our own sales process was a little too seller focused and not buyer focused enough. Yeah, and, there, and if you remember, John, as in every organization, sometimes there's pushback to that because there's mm -hmm. comfort in knowing what the salesperson is doing, what we're doing. But what the sale, what the customer is doing sometimes feels a little bit out of control. Well, we don't really know. So do the salespeople have the skills to be able to execute face-to-face -face with the customer to be able to help move those opportunities forward, to get those results? That, that's frequently overlooked. Absolutely. And, and Jason, what are some uh, real-world examples that you have of how you've worked with companies to, and what, the, the, what impact the changes have made? Well, the one I'm thinking about um, was a division of GE, and I can say it because they presented this case study with us in public before at conferences mm -hmm. and stuff. And um, so they brought us in to work with their sales managers, and we asked, you know, kind of, what's the so why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what are what are, what are you trying to do here? And they said they were really focused on improving their close rates, their win rates, actually. Sorry, the win rates of their of their deals, which they perceived as being historically low, particularly given how prominent they were in the marketplace and their market share. And and so it pretty quickly became apparent that some of the things they were doing with pipeline management was you know part of the problem and so when we when we spent some time analyzing what they were doing we discovered that basically the only pipeline management conversations they were having were these late stage conversations like i mentioned before and mm -hmm. basically they would have these meetings on friday afternoon because monday the forecast was due and um so you know we we helped them reach the conclusion and we used their own data to demonstrate that a couple of sales managers whose people had very small pipelines were actually outselling people who have very large pipelines. So we kind of introduced this idea that disqualification of deals early on is really important just to get the bad deals out so that people mm -hmm. focus on the right things and have time to do even more prospecting, um, which requires you to be even more stringent about what gets in. And we I spent some time with them on how do you coach to the sales pipeline? Like how does, we all have a coaching methodology, right? We've all been taught to coach, but, but how does that apply to early stage conversations? You know, what, what are the questions you ask? And, create some tools around early stage coaching, which was completely different from what they had done. I mean, these people had had a lot of coaching training, but it never really been applied to a specific activity. And then we you know, were able to work with them to set aside some time. Actually, we reallocated some of those Friday meetings, not to be kind of forecasting sessions, but to have these early stage discussions. And, and so focusing on the early stages of the pipeline, um, giving them clear qualification and disqualification criteria and you know, working with the sales managers to know how to do all this, you know, what reports do you pull and how do you have those conversations? It was, I mean, it takes time, right? Cause they had a very long mm -hmm. sales cycle, but within 18 months they had doubled their win rates. Right. And some of that was from having leaner pipelines. So that's going to happen necessarily. And part of it was because they were actually selling better because the managers were there to do what they can do, which is transfer their knowledge of how you engage with customers. And so it's, it's, um, it's pretty remarkable what you can do when you focus on pipeline as a, as a centerpiece of performance and a coaching tool. And, you know, the thing that's so remarkable about that story is that we didn't, we didn't train any salespeople. Like literally we never trained a, a single salesperson. I don't know if we even spoke to a salesperson, you know, but, but when your sales managers know what to do and I hold them accountable for pipeline management, mm -hmm. when you're, you know, when you're, when your sales managers know what to do, your sales people know what to do. And it's a, um, it's an interesting way to, interesting way to think about the task from a sales enablement, sales development perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, what you're talking about here is the fact is that your know, pipeline management needs to be a managed process. It needs to have a strategy behind it. It needs to have some thought put into it. It's not, if you just leave it to happen organically, it's never going to be, 
it's never going to be effective. Mm-hmm. Um, and Judy, what are some examples of companies you've worked with and how um, more proactive pipeline management has helped them? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, you know, I really loved your, your comment, Jason, about, uh, you know, it's the sales managers that are really driving this activity and, and what a critical role they play. Um, so the, the company that I wanted to speak to is a company, it's a nationwide company. They have about 100 salespeople, and they thought that they really needed negotiation skills. Their people were discounting <clears throat> significantly and having a lot of uh, price compression, and their margins were being impacted. And so we did a, a sales effectiveness improvement analysis um, through a series of uh, surveys. And as a result, we gained a lot of insight into information about the people, but we also looked at the pipeline. And we asked a lot of questions around their, their pipeline in terms of uh, you know, the opportunities that they had in their pipeline, what stages and what needed to happen, et cetera. And um, when we look at a pipeline, it typically looks like a funnel. And when we got the answers back from, uh, from this assessment, the funnel, I mean, the, the pipeline actually looked very different than what a typical funnel would look like. Um, it was very narrow at the top in terms of suspects. It was very narrow up top in terms of prospects. It was very narrow up top in terms of qualified opportunities. So it was somewhat of a, a cylinder, if you think of it that way. And then there was this huge bulge of closable opportunities. And so when we restaged the pipeline to reflect the responses from the salespeople, we found that they were putting information into the CRM, of course, that was not accurately describing the uh, opportunity, but also they were not doing effective qualification, they were not doing um, effective uh, discovery process and really understanding what is required or who the decision makers are, or what the buyer's process is. Um, so they were skipping certain stages in the process that are critical to determining if in fact viable opportunities. And so as a result, we created several um, training programs that help them improve their conversations in terms of building rapport and asking the right questions at the right time in the right way of the right people and helping them to um, collaborate with their customers in a way that creates a higher level of uh, relationship and understand what the real buying process is so that we could realign the pipeline to reflect the reality of what really was happening in the field and also help um, the salespeople develop those skills. And we also implemented a coaching program with the uh, sales managers, because as you indicated, Faith mm-hmm. and, and Bruce, you did as well. You know, this is such a critical element and most sales managers are not given the training in terms of how to coach people to uh, improve performance, take care of themselves, manage their time more effectively, and execute. Mm-hmm. As a result of teaching them how to coach and establishing clear guidelines and training their people, um, they were able to realize a 25% increase in sales in six months. Yeah. What, what I love about all of these uh, examples that all of you have given, and I think all of the information that you have given during this whole um, discussion is that there's a lot of fundamental, quite simple, I don't mean, you know, simple doesn't always equate to easy, but simple things that that if they're applied properly, if they're given the proper attention, can make an outsized difference. And, and we've got a couple of comments from people who are watching um, who have said the same thing, that you know, great practical uh, advice and the fact that it is, uh, a lot of it is very simple and almost common sense, but we know common sense isn't that common, which is always a problem. All right, well, listen, thanks, everybody, for the discussion today. I just want to give you a quick moment, uh, maybe start with you, Jason, just remind everybody how they can contact you.
sorry, Jason. Uh, see, sorry, old okay. mute button, yeah, old yeah. mute button foible. <laughs> um, well, I've already had some practice saying this, so this should come right off the uh, roll right off the list. <laughs> so you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Jason Jordan. I'm with a company called Vantage Point, and um, our website URL is vantagepointperformance.com. So if you come visit the website, you know we have invested a lot of time and, and money in getting the website to the point where it's valuable. Um, lots of resources there, um, articles, research. So come come check it out. Yeah, and, and Judy, where can they find out more about you? Yes, yeah, so I'm also on LinkedIn uh, with the Rain Group, R A I N, like uh, make it rain, uh, raingroup.com. And um, we're headquartered in Boston, and we've got representation around the globe. And I look forward to hearing from you if, in fact, you're interested in exploring how we could help you. Great. And Bruce? Yeah, John, uh, you can reach us at our website, integritysolutions.com. And uh, like Jason mentioned, it's even if you don't end up speaking to us, there is a wealth of information, and it's very simple and easily accessible there in a variety of different media that can help you, not just around pipeline management, about all aspects of sales, coaching, and customer service. Uh, you can look me up in on LinkedIn. Again, it's Bruce Wedderburn. Uh, in LinkedIn. And if you've got a question or anything I can help you with, uh, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to engage with you. Great. Listen again, thanks to Jason, Judy and Bruce for that fantastic discussion. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine at salespop.net where you'll find a wealth of resources around sales and sales related topics. And also we talked a lot about uh, pipeline management and sales process, pipeline or CRM. I would be remiss if I didn't say that this was the um, the best tool if you want to uh, develop your sales process, instant dynamic visualization, uh, a, a tool that sales people love to use. So we'll see you all for another, uh, another webinar, another panel discussion very soon.